Sam Shimon believes that John 1.14 proves and teaches the Marian doctrines. Listen. So you're telling me she's an ordinary woman, just an ordinary woman, just like one of many, when the fullness of deity, the fullness of God, the fullness of his glory was literally in her, filling her and every cell of her body for nine months. For nine months. And it's her flesh that became his flesh because he took flesh from her. And that flesh is the tabernacle where God dwells in all his fullness. And you still don't see why this woman is glorious, majestic, beautiful, the greatest of all creatures, a creature, not God. Jesus is infinitely greater than her and better than her. But Jesus in his love created her to be his mother. You get my point? She's ordinary, huh? No, oh, she's ordinary, man. Yeah, come on, man. She's just like Paul. She's just like Peter. You see how stupid this argument is? If you follow the very principles and hermeneutics of Protestant exegetes, then the logical conclusion and the necessary inference is the Marian doctrines. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. Folks, this is the problem that we have with Sam Shamoon. Welcome to the Brain Perspective. My name is Kelly Powers. We're going to be going through a clip here, which was not long ago that Sam was attempting to prove from the Bible that Mary is the mother of God. And therefore, if she is the mother of God, therefore, this must prove the Marian doctrines. Thank you for being here. We're going to walk through this point by point, and let's see if what is claimed actually is backed up biblically by the Bible. So let's start off with Sam here. Let me show you how important Mary is in your salvation. Okay, here you go. John 1, 14. So John 1, 14. On the screen here, you'll see it. So here we have over here, John 1, 14, a passage you guys know. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So he is going to attempt to talk about the word dwelt here and try to prove his point. Making sense so far? John 1, 14. Here you go. And I gave you this Bible, right? I didn't give you anything else. Sola Scriptura, Tota Scriptura, right? John 1.14. Okay, watch here. Read with me, folks. Read with me. All right. This is why I changed. I didn't change because of mere human tradition. I changed. Because I could see these passages in the Bible, and as Catholic apologists would point to them, like Dave Armstrong, God bless him, for planting those seeds, I eventually had to give in and confess and repent of my tradition in Bible perversion and admit, yeah, there's nothing wrong with this. So he had to finally give in and to admit and claims it comes from the Bible. But folks, Many of you know anything about Catholic teachings. Many of the Marian dogmas didn't come into full operation until the last couple hundred years, the full dogmas. And so majority of Catholic doctrine is based on sacred tradition, sacred scripture, and the magisterium. 
heavily on the issue of Marian doctrines comes based on tradition and the magisterium. As many of you have noted and seen in videos I've done in the past, one which got quite a few views so far, where Satan has given his soul to Satan because of the Marian doctrines. In that video, which I've demonstrated often in other videos as well, there is not one verse taught by Jesus or the apostles giving any kind of doctrinal teachings pertaining to what is known as the Marian doctrines. Now, let me put this also on the screen just for a moment here. This is from EWTN. And if you guys are able to see this here, I'll put it on the screen here. This is from EWTN, and I'll make it bigger so you can see. It has to do with um, this particular one. They're talking about wanting to bring into existence the fifth Marian doctrine, making Mary the co-mediatrix that hasn't been officially declared yet, but it is a doctrine that's still taught and is in the catechism of the Catholic Church, nonetheless. But here's what's stated. Up to the present time in the history of the Church, four Marian doctrines have been defined as central Catholic truths by the Church. First would be the motherhood of God, the immaculate conception, meaning that she was born without sin, perpetual virginity, she never had any other children, only Jesus that was done supernaturally she had no procreation nothing with joseph all those scriptures talking about him having four brothers and sisters mean nothing and talking about many times where his own flesh and blood brothers rejected him in many places all those things must not be biblical uh also the issue of her uh glorious assumption into heaven meaning that because she had no sin she could not truly taste of death so what we're going to be looking at here is sam trying let me to show you how john 114 he's going to try to defend marian doctrines from john 114 i still am shocked i'm even doing this video because it's so ridiculous but i want to demonstrate the logic of how far someone like sam and others have gone down this rabbit trail of really just trying to eisegete scriptures to make it fit what they wanted to say. Okay, Nancy Lee, God bless you. John 114 proves that Mary is instrumental in your salvation. Here you go. So John 114 proves that Mary is essential. In your salvation. Did you hear that? John 1 14 proves that Mary is essential in your salvation. Now, let me give you guys just a little bit of a news flash here. People be prior to the incarnation of Jesus Christ were always saved by faith in the Old Testament. This is nothing new. The distinction is when Christ came, Jesus came in this world and take, took on flesh. And died upon the cross and rose again. He defeated sin and death. And now gives us this new creation. This new birth. Right? To which we can now enter into the heavenly realm. With the triune God. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Right? But people were always saved. In the Old Testament. By faith. This is nothing new. And so therefore... Yes, let me just say it from the start. Mary is a blessed woman. God used her in a very unique way. Very unique. No other woman ever like this, obviously, right? And she was blessed. And she was used as a vessel for the Lord to bring forth the Son, Jesus Christ, into this world, the Redeemer, the Savior. That's awesome. That's amazing. She is to be respected. But folks, she has nothing to do with her. That has nothing to do with her being, quote unquote, born sinless, quote unquote, perpetual virginity, quote unquote, being uh, assumed into the heavenly realm, the, the immaculate assumption, and namely her being, quote unquote, the Theotokos, the mother of God. Now, what Sam is going to do here is try to prove, see, because the fullness of God dwelt in her, therefore she is the God birther, the God 
bring forth her, right? All that we see that's being talked about Mary, if you're Catholic, is God used Mary in a unique way. But we even read in Hebrews chapter 10 that it was God who prepared this body for Jesus Christ. But Mary was the instrument to bring forth Jesus into the world. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory, glory as the only son from the father. You see the word dwelt among us? When he became flesh, that's when he dwelt among us. When he took flesh, a physical body, that's how he dwelt among us. Well, let me show you what the word for dwelt among us is. You Greek readers appreciate that you read Greek. Eskinosin, excuse me for my harassment butchering of the Greek. <laughs> so this is where he's going to be taking you here. This is he's going to be reading directly from Bible Hub, uh, the interlinear here. And uh, here it is, is, is Kaneo. And here uh, the actual word that he's actually going to be quoting goes back to this over here, where it's the word up here. Uh, you can see uh, Eskinoan here, right there, Eskinosin. And this is the word that he is looking at right here, which would be then in uh, growing to uh, Skineo here. So this is what he's looking at right here, just so you guys have an idea. And the amazing thing is actually going to be quoting it pretty much word for word here. From Skinao, John 1, 14. Here you go. Protestants, in your face, those you hate this. John 1, 14. Go look at the word, Christian Malik, everyone else. Click on that link. If you see it right there, you're going to see, right? You're going to see the word dwelt among us. It's the word eskinosin, eskinosin. And what does it mean? So here's what we see it mean right here. So it says, uh, he's going to quote it, to have one's tent dwell, I dwell as an attendant camp, have a tabernacle. So that's what he's going to be quoting here in just a moment. Oh, watch here, guys, and how it plays with Mary. Okay, here you go. Click on that. Guess what the word dwelt means in the Greek? It comes from skinao, which means to have one's tent dwell. I dwell as an intent, tent. In camp, have my tabernacle. This is the word, the verbal form of skine. Guys, pay attention. You who read the Greek versions of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, the word for tabernacle, right, in Greek is skine. Skine is the Greek word used for what Moses had the priests built. The tabernacle, the tent, where God would descend in a pillar of cloud and fill it with his glory. Exodus 33, 7 to 11. Exodus 40, verses 34 to 38. Skene, tabernacle, temple, where in 1 Kings 8, 10 to 13, which is 1 Chronicles, chapter 7, sorry. Second Chronicles, my apologies. Second Chronicles, chapter 7, verses 1 to 3, verse 12, and Second Chronicles, chapter 6, verse 1 to 2. So Second Chronicles, chapter 6, verse 1 to 2, chapter 7, verse 1 to 3, and verse 12, and First Kings 8, 10 to 13, the temple that Solomon built in Greek, Skene, tabernacle, temple, where the cloud filled it as a sign that God was filling it with his glory. So John So here's what he's going through here. So this is going, this is Exodus 33 here he's looking at. You know, he's talking about over here. When you get down to it, I just want to give you guys over here. He's talking about how uh, uh, my glory is passing by, um, overshadowing. This is what he's looking at here. He's looking at Exodus 40, uh, same place over here. Um, when he was quoting here just a little while ago, going through tabernacle here, the door of the tabernacle temple of meeting. 
here again, he's going through um, first Kings. He was talking, I believe it was eight through 10 here again. So showing here that it was the Lord that filled the place, the holy place. These are the scriptures he's pointing to, right? Second Chronicles chapter seven. Again, the Shekinah glory of the Lord um, because it filled the place. These are scriptures he's using to try to build his case. Second Chronicles six. I think he'll be quoted here in just a minute as well. So let's get to it here. When Jesus became flesh, that physical body, that flesh body of Jesus now became the tabernacle, the tent, the temple where God dwells in all the fullness of his glory. So Jesus' physical body is the new abiding ta tabernacle temple of God. You with me there? Before I move on. So it is true when you're looking at John 1 and it says like the word became flesh. Jesus, according to Colossians 2, which he'll go to a little later, he is God come in the flesh. All these different verses that he's bringing up, though, literally prove nothing. They have no significance to Mary. He's going to eventually try to bring this about back to Luke chapter 1, where it talks about um, that uh, the power of the Holy Spirit is overshadowing, power most high, or the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon her to basically bring her forth to have this super um, being pregnant, and the power of the Most High will overshadow her. But none of these verses that he's trying to bring together prove the motherhood of God of these Marian doctrines. This is, again, showing a twisting of scriptures in an eisegetical form to try to prove something that's not there. He's reading things into the text, things that are not there that are taught. You with me there? Yeah, I might have to do a part two. Yeah, I'm going to have to retitle this. We got it? And this is confirmed in John 2, 19 to 22. Do you remember what Jesus said? Destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. John 2, 19 to 22. And the Jews said, it has taken 46 years for you to build the temple. Yet you will raise it up in three days. And then John said, but the temple that he was speaking of was his body. And it's true. Jesus answered, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said it took 46 years to build and raise it up. But this he spoke of the temple of his body. And if you notice verse 22, it says, but when he was raised, and the disciples remember he said this, and they believed the scripture, which he was saying. So yes, Jesus, he's talking about the temple. He is the temple come. He's the Shekinah glory. He even said later in Matthew chapter 12, something greater than the temple is here. He says, if you had known this, that is the desire, um, not sacrifice, but mercy and, and, and kindness. And he says that you may know that the son of man is the Lord of the Sabbath. He is above the temple. He is above all these things. He is, the image of the invisible God, Colossians 1.15. He is the exact representation of God in his being, Hebrews 1.3, who pasta see as correct are. So yes, but again, these are he's begging the question. He's, he's bringing this information that is does not teach that Marian doctrines known as the motherhood of God, these things are not there. This is this is a reading into the Bible versus of things that are not there. After he was raised, the disciples remember this and the scripture that was fulfilled. So Jesus says, my physical body is the temple that I will raise in three days. All right, now we got a problem. If Jesus' flesh, his physical body, is the temple, the tabernacle, the tent, where God dwells in all his fullness, who gave him that flesh? Who gave him the flesh as his temple and tabernacle? Well, I can tell you who gave him the flesh. It would be the Lord. I mean, this is what we read over in Hebrews chapter 10, 
uh, verse 5 says, Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you've not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. So who is the one that prepared a body for Jesus? It was the Lord. It was the Father. Mary was just used as the instrument to bring him forth as a human into this world. But it was the Father who prepared this body, not Mary. Who? Can you tell me? And when he was in her womb, being formed as a baby, where he was forming himself with the Father's Spirit in Mary's womb, dwelling in her womb, in her sack, being nourished from her and shaping his body for that nine months, who was then his tabernacle, his temple that he dwelt in with all his fullness? Mary's body. That's fine. Nothing wrong with that. That's okay. You got it now? Always did. Now let me show you something else. You ready for me to show you something else? We're right, ready. Watch here. Hey, watch here, guys. Luke 9, 34 and 35. Luke 9, 34, 35. Okay, watch here. As he th said this, a cloud came. Now notice that word overshadowed them. So notice here, he's going to say, remember that word, right? So here, as he was saying, a cloud form began to overshadow. See that word overshadow right there? So here, this is where we get the word. Uh, over here, you can see that again, this is Bible hub. And overshadowing right here. Here it is here. And here's the word. You can see it on your screen. Uh, epi ski adozo, adzo. And this simply means to overshadow, uh, to cast shadow upon, overshadow, which leaves a natural result. So simply put, when this was taking place, uh, the cloud form began to overshadow them. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing, nothing, you know, this was a, a very unique thing. But again, watch how he's going to try to use this word overshadow here in a little bit. He's going to try to play Mr. Um, uh, you know, uh, smart, but it fails. And we'll see that in just a moment. Overshadowed. So when Jesus was on the mountain, he, Peter, James, and John, and then Moses and Elijah, Jesus transfigured to show his inner abiding divine glory radiating through his physical body. Then the cloud came down on Jesus, Peter, James, and John, just like the cloud came down on Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, Exodus chapter 19, Exodus chapter 20, Exodus chapter 24. Exodus chapter 19, Exodus chapter 20, Exodus chapter 24, and Exodus chapter 33 and 34. The pillar of cloud came down on the mount, and the pillar of cloud filled the tabernacle. And here's the cloud coming down on Jesus, Peter, James, and John, overshadowing them, because Jesus is now the physical tabernacle that houses the fullness of God. Okay, now watch. Hold on. Now, this is an important point. One of the things that in this thing that Sam is also doing that he is missing the boat completely is not only, yes, does the fullness of the Father dwell in Jesus. We read about that, like uh, Colossians 1, 19 through 22. We see that, you know, throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus says that the Father is in him and he's in the Father, things like that. But remember this, Jesus for a time also set aside his glory, Philippians chapter 2, right? So even though Jesus was by nature God and God come in the flesh, he for a time set aside his glory, right? What Sam is attempting to do here 
is saying that all the fullness, which is technically true, but he's basically baiting you, going you through these scriptures to try to say, see, because Mary was tabernacling and having Jesus dwell within her, therefore she must be this unique, special one, this mother of God, if you will, but that is foreign to the scriptures. In fact, you'll never see that in the scriptures about Mary being this mother who birthed God. Don't see that at all. Don't see it taught by Jesus. Don't see it taught by um, the apostles. Mary was the instrument to bring forth Jesus, who is by nature God. But to say that she is the mother of God, the one that gave birth, this is where other religions and other groups would just laugh at us. This makes no sense. But what, as you saw earlier from the first clip, because Sam wants so desperately to hold on to these Marian doctrines, and he's walking through all these verses to try to prove something that's just not there, he's using scriptures with truth. There's no doubt a lot of things that what he is stating is actually accurate in the sense of Mary being used to bring forth Jesus, who is by nature God. But the way that he is doing fails because it does not prove the Marian doctrines. And this will be demonstrated even more so as he continues on. Watch. Read the verse with me. And as he said this, a cloud came and overshadowed them. And they were afraid as they entered the cloud, like Moses entered the cloud, Exodus 24, 9 to 18, right? And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen, listen to him. All right, now watch this. Do you see the word overshadowed? Watch here. Luke 9, 34. And a cloud overshadowed them. Now. So here it is. So that word that overshadow, like I said, and this is the, the work here, the word here. This is where it is over here. You'll see it. This is the word. And we're going to be going now to Luke chapter two, where he's going to be taking us and looking at, or sorry, Luke chapter one. And what we're going to be looking at here is how Mary um, is going to be basically the same kind of thing going on here with her being overshadowed so watch this Gabriel says is going to happen to the blessed mother let's see if you catch it here you go Luke 1 34 to 35 Luke 1 34 to 35 so that's on the screen right there so Luke 31 34 to 35 Mary said to the angel how can this be since I'm a virgin the angel answered and said to her, this, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, right? Will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Now, what's interesting here is that here we see uh, the word being used here for come upon you. Now, what's fascinating here is that word upon her in, in Luke chapter 1. This is what we see over here in verse 34. Let me just put this on the screen real quickly here for you. And we're going to show you what this word here is. Let's just look at it here in the interlinear. So said then Mary to the angel, how will this be since I, since a man I know, uh, not I know, right? So here, then we get to verse 35 and we see here coming up on the screen. Watch this. The angel said to her, the spirit, the Holy Spirit will come upon now, if you see this word here, epi, epi means to come upon or to empower, right? In fact, this is what we see also in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where Jesus is teaching his apostles that the Holy Spirit will come upon believers, right? See this over here? But you will receive power having come the Holy Spirit upon. See that same word? is the word epi. Friends, if Mary is supposed to have this special overshadowing power from the Holy Spirit, which means she is tabernacling God, 
because of the power of the Holy Spirit overshadowing her and coming upon her, then friends, we also then are tabernacles of God too, right? Now that, of course, we know that we are called in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, actually, now that I'm thinking about it too, we're actually called the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. But that doesn't mean that we are anything special. We're not like what Sam likes to say, the, the most uh, greatest of all creations. We have the presence of God dwelling within us because of now being born again. Same thing with Mary. Mary, who is a human just like us, a physical person just like us. She, yes, she was, it's going to sound horrible to the Catholic, but yes, she was a sinner. She was not born without sin, but God used her in a unique way, just like how he comes upon us at times and uses us as sinners. We are sinners. We're not without sin. And yet the Holy Spirit will come upon us and fill us. And we are called the temple of God. Yet we are sinners. The point that I'm trying to say here is that does not exclude Mary. Just because it says that Mary, over here in Luke chapter 1, it says here that the angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Well, here the Holy Spirit's coming upon giving her birth. That's the same Greek word there for epi and the same word for overshadow, which is the same word that was being brought up over here, is the same thing. Just, just means that they're coming, overshadowing and, and, and coming upon, if you will. This does not prove that Mary was, so to speak, unique of everyone else out there because she was the one that brought forth Jesus. We have the power of God to come upon us at times and overshadow us at times. And we are called the temple of the, you know, that the of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We are just like Mary, and Mary is just like us. It doesn't take away from Mary's uniqueness and blessedness to bring forth Jesus. But just the point that I want to emphasize here is that this is the problem with Catholicism. Tradition, sacred tradition, and magisterium. What they both do is they go outside of the scriptures. And that's the dangers. And that's where Sam is going right now. Yeah, I'm going to have to do Christmas Victor maybe tomorrow, guys. Took me longer than normal. Luke 1, 34 to 35. And Mary said to the angel, how shall this be since I have no husband? And the angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. The same word. The cloud overshadowed the tabernacle. The cloud overshadowed Jesus, James, Peter, and John on the mount. And Mary will be overshadowed by the power of God. Same word used in Luke 9.34. For the cloud descending upon Jesus, James, Peter, and John. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Did you catch it? Did you guys catch it? So... You guys, did you guys catch that? What did you catch? It's just talking about the power of God overshadowing, and this is the supernatural birth that was prophesied going back to Isaiah 7, going back to Isaiah 9, Psalm 2, all these different references that were messianic foretelling the coming of the child, the supernatural one. And Mary is that blessed virgin that was prophesied from Isaiah 7, right? And Jesus is that son of God, the one that was came forth from the Father, we see in Scripture. But Mary, again, was the vessel. The vessel. But nothing here teaches Marian doctrines. Nothing here teaches that she was the birther of the will, of, if you will, of God. Jesus was already by nature God. She was just the vessel that was helping bring him forth into this world. Doesn't teach Marian doctrines in regards to her being sinless. It doesn't teach her perpetual virginity. 
and these things don't teach the assumption of Mary. Remember in the first part of this clip, Sam says, all these things prove the Marian doctrines. No, no, they do not. If Jesus' physical body is the living, abiding tabernacle, temple of God, where God dwells in all his fullness. Don't worry about my denomination before I block you, Spectre. Right? In all his fullness. And yet Jesus took that flesh body from the virgin. And while he was in the virgin's womb, shaping, forming his physical body with the Father and the Spirit, he was tabernacling in her womb, and he was being formed and fashioned as a male baby in her womb. That means she literally had God, literally tabernacling, literally in her belly, in all his fullness, literally for nine months, and literally coming out of her and taking flesh from her. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. See, the problem with what he's doing here is he's equating all these verses. And again, like I said, he's got a little bit of truth and he's twisting it to try to prove a doctrine. All that he is doing right now is trying to prove this statement over here from Luke chapter one. Everything that he's been presenting so far is all trying to stack the deck, if you will, at. Luke chapter 1, verse 34 and 35. All that we see here is Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I'm a virgin? The angel said there, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, meaning come upon and to empower, right? To give her the ability to be able to have a child and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, meaning this is how this supernatural birth is going to take place. And for that reason, that holy child shall be called the Son of God. This does not teach what the Catholic Church tries to teach, what's called as the Marian doctrines that I was put, talking about before over here. This does not teach this. This does not prove this. These teachings that are from the Catholic Church, these are teachings that have come as additional things that are known as the sacred tradition and from the magisterium. These doctrines are not taught in the Bible. And that's why Sam is doing spiritual gymnastics here to try to make a point that is just not taught in the Bible. Nope, she's not special. No, no, no. She's just regular. She's just regular, man. That's all she is. She had God literally in her belly, literally dwelling in all his fullness, literally being shaped and formed as a human male baby without ceasing to be God, literally filled with the fullness of the glory of God, literally having the fullness of deity in her physical body. Because of Colossians 2 9, it's true that Mary had the whole fullness of deity in her body. Why? Because look what Colossians 2 9 says. Because until he had a physical body, it was her physical body that was his tabernacle. Colossians 2 9. Colossians 2 9. Now, chocolate, I've done several sessions already on this very issue. Go do my YouTube channel, search Mary, Ark of the Covenant, Mary, Marian doctrines. I already did sessions on the road articles, but here, guys, help me understand biblical. I'm using just Bible, right? Okay, I'm just using Bible. Now, help me, guys, with the logic. Colossians 2 9. For in him, Jesus, the whole fullness of deity. Theotis, Theotis, right? Theotitus. He's trying, he's trying, he's trying. So here we have the word, which is the word he is, uh, Theotes, uh, trying to pronounce, but not doing a great job. Um, yes, and here it talks about deity, Godhead, personal God revealed from the Bible who is triune, infinitely relational, as demonstrated by the embodiment of the Godhead in the incarnate Christ. Yes, so this is talking about how Jesus came in the flesh, and he was by nature God. That's what we see 
being taught over here in Colossians chapter 2, as he's talking about on the screen, this part again is true. Dwells, dwells, absolutely dwells, right? So this is important, but notice how he's again trying to use a scripture that has nothing to do with Marian doctrine. Now, the ironic thing, if you can see this on your screen and you're watching with me, look at just the verses just before this here. What does Paul say? See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. And this is exactly what Sam is doing right now. He is teaching things that Paul warned about rather than according to Christ. Huh? So this is the importance of seeing how dangerous what Sam is doing. He's playing Bible hopscotch, doing spiritual gymnastics, twisting scriptures to his own destruction, as Paul uh, Peter warned about people did with Paul's writings in Second Peter chapter 3. Titus, John said how Greek would say it, Theodotos, that which makes God, God, that which makes God, God. All the fullness of what makes God what he is. Jesus has all the fullness of it. Full, perfect deity he possesses bodily. Yeah, I'll debate him. Bring him here and bring your mother to them. I'll debate both of them. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. So if Jesus, as a man with a physical body, is still the fullness of deity, whatever makes God God, he possesses it in its fullness bodily as a physical glorified human being. So when Jesus was in Mary's womb, what did Mary have literally residing in her? The whole fullness of deity. Because isn't your mother, is she a prostitute then? This is how she gave birth to you because she did muta with the Shia. This is why Uthman is upset because he wanted to do Messiah with her. Now shut that up and get out of here, you filth. Was fun. <laughs> With me there? This guy is a moron. So, when Jesus did not have a physical body, but was in Mary's womb for nine months, taking a physical body, where was the fullness of deity residing? Where was the complete perfection of deity residing? Wasn't it residing in her? Am I wrong? Where am I wrong, guys? Can you help me out? You're wrong in the sense of what you're trying to build a case that's just simply not there. No one denies that when Jesus was being incarnated, that he was the fullness of God coming to flesh. That's what John 1.14 teaches, Colossians 2.9, Hebrews 1.3, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5-11 through 11 teaches. This is clearly classic Trinitarianism. No doubt. The problem, though, is you're trying to build a case, stack the deck, using all these different verses to try to build your case about being overshadowed by the power of the Most High to prove the case that Mary is, in fact, the mother of God, Theotokos. But the problem is that is not what Jesus taught. That's not at all what the apostles taught. Therefore, your conclusion is false. And therefore, your case for Marian doctrines is heretical. Can you help me out here? So you're telling me she's an ordinary woman, just an ordinary woman, just like one of many, when the fullness of deity, the fullness of God, the fullness of his glory was literally in her, filling her and every cell of her body for nine months. For nine months, and it's her flesh that became his flesh because he took flesh from her, and that flesh is the tabernacle where God dwells in all his fullness. And you still don't see why this woman is glorious, majestic, beautiful, 
the greatest of all creatures, a creature, not God. Jesus is infinitely greater than her and better than her. But Jesus in his love created her to be his mother. You get my point? She's ordinary, huh? Yeah, she's ordinary, man. Yeah, come on, man. She's just like Paul. She's just like Peter. You see how stupid this argument is? If you follow the very principles and hermeneutics of Protestant exegetes, then the logical conclusion and the necessary inference is the Marian doctrines. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. So here's the problem that we have as we wrap up. The Marian doctrines that is being tried to be taught uh, and proved by people like Sam Shamoon here. And we see here, this is one site among many that this is what's known as the good Catholic. What are the four main Marian dogmas, right? He just said that a minute ago that this teaching leads so Mary giving birth to Jesus, who is by nature God, proves the Marian doctrine. So here's one. So this is the Mary, mother of God. This, this is one that he would say here is supposed to be proving that, which it does not. The ever virgin, the perpetual virginity of Mary, which is unbiblical because we would see it in multiple places in Scripture uh, that teach uh, against that. I mean, just... Simple, simple common sense, my friends, teaches that in Mary, we see two specific places, actually three specific places I can think of, but I want to show you three right now. Just watch this with me here for a second. It should be on your screen with me here. Matthew chapter one, right? That was being talked about her. Mary, your, uh, your wife, he's, uh, being spoken to Joseph, being told his wife, your child has been covered, uh, conceived in her with the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. You'll call his name Jesus. He will save his people from their sins. This took place was spoken of the Lord through the prophet. So the virgin shall be with child and bear a son. She shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. So Joseph, Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the, of the Lord commanded him and took his Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son. Simple, basic reading, friends, simply means this. As she was pregnant with a supernatural birth as a virgin, he did not touch her physically until after she gave birth to Jesus, and then they procreated and had children. That's just common sense. Until she gave birth, to her son in matthew chapter 13 a very common text that many of you would know which is also in mark chapter 6 as well but look at this over here with me matthew chapter 13 look at this here when he finished these sayings he departed from there came to his own hometown began teaching them in the synagogue so they were astonished and they said where did this man get this wisdom these miraculous powers is not this the carpenter's son is not his mother called Mary, his brothers, James, Joseph, and Simon, Judas? Now, they try to say here it's talking about cousins. Don't be fooled by that. It's specific here. And sisters. There is no other way that sisters can be translated. It's sisters. It literally proves he had biological sisters. Are they not all with us? Where did this man get these things? So here we see physical birth through um, Mary and Joseph. Now look at this here in regards to John chapter 7. Verse 3 states, look at verse 3. This is now when he's at the Feast of the Booths was near. His brother said to him, leave here and go into Judea so that your disciples may see your good works that you are doing. No one does good, does anything in secret when himself, when himself seeks to be known publicly. If you do these things, show yourself to the crowd. For not even his brothers were believing in him. This is fascinating. This is talking about his biological brothers. This is important. What's another interesting thing here that we see 
that's being talked about here. The Immaculate Conception, that over here that she was born without sin. Again, this is not a biblical case. In fact, we would see in Luke chapter 1, again, the same context, same, same thing going on here, that she's fascinated that she is a virgin. Somehow she's going to be having able to have a child, right? And give forth, um, you know, bring forth this, this special one. Here we see Mary said, my soul exalts the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. Now, Catholics will try to say, no, this is, does not in any way teach that Mary was in need of a Savior. That is false. We would see Paul state clearly in Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 3, that for all have sinned, all have sinned. The only one that we read ever in Scripture is Jesus. We read about that in Hebrews chapter 4. He was without sin. Hebrews chapter 2. For all of sin and fall short to the glory of God. So this includes Mary. Mary, my friends, was born with sin. So here we see, and if this is not even strong enough, let's just give you one more, one more piece here that we'll get demonstrated here. Romans chapter 5. When you're reading verses 12 through 18, therefore just as through one man sin entered into the world, death through sin, so death uh, spread to all men because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed when there was no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam unto Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one, many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by grace of the one man, Christ Jesus, or Jesus Christ, abound to the many. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression, resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, free gift arose from the many transgressions, resulting in justification. For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in him, in life, through the one, Jesus Christ. So look at this here. As it closes here. So then, as through one transgression, there resulted in condemnation to all men. That includes Mary. But she believed. Therefore, there's no condemnation for her. Even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. For just through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Even, though, even so, through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. The law came in so the transgression would increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ. So we see not only is Mary not the mother of God, the Theotokos, Mary was not a perpetual virgin. Mary was not born without sin. And the last one that's here is called the Assumption of Mary, where the teaching is, is that Mary did not taste of death, but she was actually taken into heaven, assumed into heaven before she ever would taste death. Now here, this goes here, the tradition of Mary's assumption dates back to the early, early Christians, although it's not affirmed as infallible until 1950. This is not taught in the scriptures. This is not taught for many, many centuries. This came many, many years later. So this is a, an assumption. This is a teaching that's built upon tradition, sacred tradition, and the magisterium, not based on the Bible. So as I conclude here and go back to him, this is what Sam said a little while ago, just towards the end, and this is what he said here. You get my point? She's ordinary, huh? Yeah, she's ordinary, man. Sure. Yeah, come on, man. She's just like Paul. She's just like Peter. You see how stupid this argument is? If you follow the very principles and hermeneutics of Protestant exegetes, 
then the logical conclusion and the necessary inference is the Marian doctrines. No, this is not true. What happens is, is if you follow your logic, what happens is, is exactly what took place with what Paul said in Colossians 2. That if you are being held captive through philosophy and empty deception according to traditions of men and according to the elements of the world, you will fall into these eisegesis kind of beliefs. Because remember this part here, it says, rather than according to Christ. This is the foundation that we get, friends. What did Jesus teach? In fact, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20, Jesus says to his disciples, go and teach in them all that I've commanded you. And here's an important point. Where do we see Jesus in the Gospels ever teach anything about Mary being his mother, Mary being born without sin, Mary being a perpetual virgin, and the, the assumption of Mary that would be later? Where do we see this taught in the book of Acts? Where do we see this taught by Peter, Paul, John? John was the one that was entrusted with Mary to take to be taken to, uh, Mary to be taken care of by him, by Jesus. Where do we read about anything of Mary in John's writings other than the Gospel of John? Nowhere. And in fact, actually, even in the Gospel of John, it's only really alluded to in just a couple of places. But nothing's directly taught about her, anything of this kind of uh, teaching. And if you read the epistles, nothing is ever there. And yet this is supposed to be dogmas, doctrines that are supposed to be built upon what this guy over here is claiming. So as I wrap up here, friends, today this was demonstrated that Sam, sadly, is not only has he given his soul to Satan, but now he's under his influence and he's used as a servant of Satan, sadly, one who is being disguised as an angel of light, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, right? This is where we've got to be Bereans. This is where we've got to test everything by the word of God. Examine, hold fast that was good and true, right? 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. Study to show yourself approved, a workman not ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2, 15. Be a Berean, go to the scriptures, test what he says, test what I say and see whether or not these things are so. Thank you for being here. Thank you for checking out this video. Please like this video. Please subscribe. If you'd like to help to be a part of this ministry to help support it, there's also a link in the video description if you'd like to be a part of that through PayPal. Lord bless you. May you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. May you know Jesus Christ as your true Lord and Savior, that he died upon the cross, rose again. He is the Son of God. He is the Savior. He's the one that died for you. You can be set free and have eternal life right now. If you trust in him, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13 says, you believe in your heart and God raised him to the dead. You shall be saved. You confess him as Lord. You don't have to be a part of the Catholic church, Eastern Orthodox church, or any of the others. It's about a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. And you are saved by faith, not works, not through some church, but it, by grace through faith that we saved. It is a gift of God. Ephesians chapter 8 and 9. You call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. And then when you are saved, you have this new birth in you. And now you'll no longer be walking to your own desires, though there'll be this, this conflict, but now you'll be serving the Lord, and now you'll be doing fruit and good deeds that will be glorifying God and helping others come to know Jesus Christ, the true gift of eternal life. Amen. Lord bless you. May you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Second Peter chapter 3.18, as I mentioned a moment ago. Lord bless you.